Hi everyone, this week's teaching assistant is called Lucky. She's called Lucky because she's still lucky to be uh, alive because she's just not very bright. Her sense of self-preservation is basically non-existent. All right, let's get started with this week's topic, which is service user preferences and values. We'll discuss um, this topic in light of a focus on human needs and rights and anti-oppressive practice. In order to understand anti-oppressive practice, I encourage you to read more about the concept of cultural humility. The recommended reading for this week I know is a little dated. It's probably older than half the class, but it's still very, very relevant. So service user preference uh, is the second important component of evidence-based practice. It looks at all of the factors that we're going to look at today, as well as the one for uh, next class, which will be engagement. So first of all, we need to understand what human rights are and how they work within uh, social work. If we look at human needs without considering the human rights that underlie those needs, we are failing in social work approaches. So human rights are those rights that are indelible. So that means you can't take them away from people. Uh, they're inherent to people and they have been codified in the United Nations Charter of Rights and Freedoms to which Canada is a signatory and has ratified it. That means that Canada recognizes that there's fundamental human rights that each person um, should have and they cannot be taken away from that person. And we need to understand this within a political context because there's been systematic oppression that has ensured that certain groups of people in our society are not getting their human rights. There's also marginalization that is taking away the human rights of portions of the population. And there's disparities in the access to resources, which significantly impacts people's human rights. For instance, the right to safety um, and freedom from violence. Even today in Canada, police violence against uh, black and people of color is higher than against white people. And that is due to that systemic oppression and the marginalization of racialized people. So all of this means that we really need to pay attention to these systemic forces and not assign blame to individuals when they ask for help. We need to recognize that um, human rights indicate that people are all guaranteed the same uh, outcome, you know, safety or the right to a home, um, and that they are not uh, responsible for the oppressions that they face in this society. So it's all about seeing injustice inherent in the conditions people face as opposed to something that is their own fault or that they brought on upon themselves. And we need to see how that uh, is associated with who gets what resources. Um, every time there's tax cuts, who uh, is the one that has to pay in terms of service cuts so that someone else can get a tax break. This is why a lot of the uh, discussion around human needs and human rights always um, gets back to looking at a political solution because who um, gets taxed, where the funding comes from, it's all down to what the government does. In social work, we've responded to this through the increase in anti-oppressive practice. So broadly, what this means is identifying strategies to deconstruct and reconstruct power in a way that addresses the systemic inequalities. And these systemic inequalities are operating simultaneously at the individual group in institutional level. And we want to reduce that oppression as opposed to producing and reproducing it. So, for example, what that might mean, um, say we were to look at substance abuse, we need to consider uh, the mental health 
issues that are related to substance abuse, the lack of resources available for people who are suffering from substance abuse, and as well the role of the opioid epidemic in um, promoting substance abuse and the role that doctors played in over prescribing opioids to people who are in pain um, and now treating those same people um, as if the reason that they became addicted to opioids is their own fault and had nothing to do with over prescription rates uh, and the influences of um, a lot of outside forces that uh, hid for a very long time the impact of opioids on people. So we need to consider how the individual community and systems interact to maintain systematic oppression. If we keep going with our example of uh, substance use, we can consider that at the individual level, uh, certain people are more at risk um, for developing substance use disorders depending on their current mental health status. People with mental health issues can turn to substances as a way to um, medicate an untreated mental health condition. And that's related to what's going on in the community. If the community doesn't have sufficient mental health supports to address people's mental health issues, then their mental health needs go unmet and they're forced to um, medicate in other ways to deal with their conditions. And the system uh, underlines both of these factors by determining what resources are provided at the community level and also how as a society we view the issues that are at the community and individual level. Turning now to cultural competence. So culture represents the values, norms, and traditions that affect how individuals of a particular group perceive, think, interact, behave, and make judgments about their world. Now, for a long time, we talked about cultural competence. This came out of the medical field, and really it referred to uh, the ability for uh, professionals to demonstrate competence towards service users who have diverse values, beliefs, and feelings by considering their social, cultural, and psychological uh, needs and requiring cross-cultural communication as a mandatory part of effective healthcare provision. And the goal really was um, very well-meaning. They wanted to provide effective care regardless of race, gender, or ethnic um, background uh, through increasing awareness of diverse cultures, changing people's attitudes and being more open to diverse cultures, increasing people's knowledge about the diverse cultures, um, etc. However, as you notice, what's missing here is that um, there is this basic assumption that all culture of a particular group is going to be very much the same and that a professional from outside of that culture can become um, an expert and be competent uh, in a culture that they have not experienced, which, as you can tell, is quite problematic. So now we're moving more and more towards the concept of cultural humility. Now, within cultural humility, we recognize the fact that we are coming from a place of otherness. And what we have to do is maintain that um, position of being open to the other in relation to aspects of the cultural identity that are most important to our service users. So not every um, client that we encounter is going to uh, practice their culture the same way or interpret it the same way. So the focus now is on self-humility rather than trying to achieve a state of knowledge or awareness that might blind us to our lack of uh, actual competency. This concept was also developed in healthcare but has been adapted for social work in other fields to learn more about the experiences and identities um, of our service users in order to increase the quality of the relationships and interactions. And I have this video for you here that will be posted to Blackboard um, that you have to watch as part of this week's uh, course material. It describes culture of humility and its importance in practice uh, a lot better than I can. So in summary, 
We take into account service users' preferences and values by engaging in anti-oppressive practice, recognizing that individual problems are the result of society, societal level um, oppressions and barriers to full engagement in society. And we approach our service users with cultural humility to addresses and acknowledges differences between social worker and service user. Um, and also acknowledges our lack of knowledge about our service users' uh, use of culture and what role it plays in their lives and the need to be uh, open-minded, non-judgmental um, and ask questions and be open to what our service users slash clients have to say.